Chapter 21, The Star Cloister Uninterruptedly, new emissaries from all parts of Fantasia poured in to swell the army of those accompanying Bastion on his march to the Ivory Tower. It proved impossible to take account because new ones kept arriving while the counting was in progress. Each morning, an army several thousand strong got underway, and each night it set up the strangest tent city imaginable. Since Bastion's traveling companions varied enormously in shape and size, some of their night lodgings might have been mistaken for circus tents, while others, at the opposite end of the scale, were no bigger than a, th bigger than a thimble. Uninterruptedly, new emissaries from all parts of Fantasia poured in to swell the army of those accompanying Bastion on his march to the Ivory Tower. It proved impossible to take account because new ones kept arriving while the counting was in progress. Each morning, an army several thousand strong got underway, and each night it set up the strangest tent city imaginable. Since Bastion's traveling companions varied enormously in shape and size, some of their night lodgings might have been mistaken for circus tents, while others, at the opposite end of the scale, were no bigger than a thimble. Their vehicles also showed astonishing variety, ranging from common covered wagons and diligences to the most extraordinary rolling barrels, bouncing balls, and crawling containers with automotive legs. Of all the tents, the most magnificent was the one that had been procured for Bastion. The shape and size of a small house, it was made of lustrous, many-colored silk embroidered with gold and silver. A flag affixed to the roof was decorated with Bastion's coat of arms, a seven-armed candelabrum. The inside was furnished with soft blankets and cushions. Bastion's tent was always set up at the corner of the camp and the blue djinn, who had become his factotum, stood guard at the entrance. Atreyu and Falkor were still among the host of Bastion's companions, but since the public reprimand, he hadn't exchanged a word with them. Secretly, he was waiting for Atreyu to give in and apologize, but Atreyu did nothing of the kind, nor did Falkor show any inclination to humble himself before Bastion. And that, said Bastion to himself, was just what they must learn to do. If they expected him to back down, they had another think coming. His will was of steel, but if they gave in, he'd welcome them with open arms. If Atreyu knelt down to him, he would lift him up and say, Don't kneel to me, Atreyu. You are and remain my friend. But for the time being, Atreyu and Falkor brought up the rear of the procession. Falkor seemed to have forgotten how to fly. He trudged along on foot, and Atreyu walked beside him, most of the time with bowed head. A sad come-down for the proud reconnaissance flyers. Bastion wasn't happy about it, but there was nothing he could do. He began to be bored riding the mule Yika in the lead of the caravan, and took to visiting Zaida in her litter instead. She received him with a great show of respect, gave him the most comfortable seat, and squatted down at his feet. She could always think of something interesting to talk about, and when she noticed that he disliked speaking of his past in the human world, she stopped questioning him about it. Most of the time, she smoked her oriental water pipe. The stem looked like an emerald green viper, and the mouthpiece, which she held between her marble white fingers, suggested a snake's head. She seemed to be kissing it as she smoked. The clouds of smoke which poured indolently from her mouth and nose changed color with every puff from blue to yellow to pink to green and so on. Zaida, said Bastion on one of his visits looking thoughtfully at the armored giants who were carrying the litter. There's something I've been wanting to ask you. Your slave is listening, said Zaida. When I fought your guards, said Bastion, I discovered that there was nothing inside their shell of armor. So what makes them move? My will, said Zaida with a smile. It's because they're empty that they do my will. 
My will can control anything that's empty. She turned her red and green gaze on Bastion. For a moment, it gave him a strangely eerie feeling, but quickly she lowered her lashes. Could I control them with my will? he asked. Of course you could, my lord and master, she replied. You could do it a hundred times better than I. I am as nothing beside you. Would you care to try? Not now, said Bastion, who was rather frightened at the idea. Maybe some other time. Tell me, said Zaida, do you really enjoy riding an old mule? Wouldn't you rather be carried by beings you can move with your will? But Yika likes to carry me, said Bastion, almost peevishly. It gives her pleasure. Then you do it to please her? Why not, said Bastion. What's wrong with that? Zaida let some green smoke rise from her mouth. Oh, nothing at all, my lord. How can anything you do be wrong? What are you driving at, Zaida? She bowed her head of flaming red hair. You think of others too much, my lord and master, she whispered. No one is worthy to divert your attention from your own all-important development. If you promise not to be angry, I will venture a piece of advice. Think more of your own perfection. What has that got to do with Yika? Not much, my lord. Hardly anything. Just this. She's not a worthy mount for someone as important as you. It grieves me to see you riding such an undistinguished animal. All your traveling companions are surprised. You alone, my lord and master, seem unaware of what you owe to yourself. Bastion said nothing, but Zaida's words had made an impression. Next day, as the procession with Bastion and Yika in the lead was passing through lush rolling meadows, interspersed here and there by small copses of fragrant lilac, he decided to take Zaida's advice. At noon, when the caravan stopped to rest, he patted the old mule on the neck and said, Yika, the time has come for us to part. Yika let out a cry of dismay. Why, master? she asked. Have I done my job so badly? And tears flowed from the corners of her dark eyes. Not at all, Bastion hastened to reassure her. You've been carrying me so gently all this time. You've been so patient and willing that I've decided to reward you. I don't want another, any other reward, said Yika. I just want to go on carrying you. How could I wish for anything better? Didn't you once tell me it made you sad that mules can't have children? Yes, said Yika, because when I'm very old, I'd like to tell my children about these happy days. Very well, said Bastion. Then I'll tell you a story that will come true, and I'll tell it only to you. To you and no one else, because it's your story. Then he took hold of one of Yika's long ears and whispered into it. Not far from here, in a little lilac copse, the father of your son is waiting for you. He's a white stallion with the white wings of a swan. His mane and his tail are so long they touch the ground. He has been following you secretly for days because he's immortally in love with you. With me? cried Yika, almost frightened. But I'm only a mule, and I'm not as young as I used to be. In his eyes, said Bastion in an undertone, you're the most beautiful creature in all Fantasia, just as you are, and also perhaps because you've carried me. But he's very bashful. He doesn't dare approach you with all these creatures about. You must go to him, or he'll die of longing for you. Meow me, Yika sighed. Is it as bad as all that? Yes, Bastion whispered in her ear. And now, goodbye, Yika. Just run along. You'll find him. Yika took a few steps, but then she looked back again. Frankly, she said, I'm kind of scared. There's nothing to worry about, said Bastion with a smile. And don't forget to tell your children and grandchildren about me. Thank you, Master said Yika, and off she went. For a long while, Bastion looked after her as she hobbled off. He wasn't really happy about sending her away. 
he went to his luxurious tent, lay down on the soft cushions, and gazed at the ceiling. He kept telling himself that he had made Yika's dearest wish come true, but that didn't make him feel any better. A person's reason for doing someone a good turn matters as much as the good turn itself. But that made no difference to Yika, for she really did find the white-winged stallion. They married, and she had a son who was a white-winged mule. His name was Pataplan, and he made quite a name for himself in Fantasia. But that's another story and shall be told another time. From then on, Bastion traveled in Zaida's litter. She even offered to get out and walk alongside so as to give him every possible comfort. But that was more than Bastion would accept. So they sat together in the comfortable red coral litter, which from then on led the procession. Bastion was still rather gloomy and felt a certain resentment towards Zaida for persuading him to part with his mule. He kept answering her in monosyllables, so that no real conversation was possible. Zaida soon realized what the trouble was. To guide his thoughts into different channels, she said brightly, I would like to make you a present, my lord and master, if you deign to accept one from me. She rummaged under her cushions and found a richly ornamented casket. As Bastion tingled with eagerness, she opened it and took out a belt with chain links. Each link, as well as the clasp, was made of clear glass. What is it? Bastion asked. It's a belt that makes its wearer invisible. But if you want it to belong to you, my lord, you must give it its name. Bastion examined it. The belt Gamal, he said then. Zaida nodded. Now it is yours, she said with a smile. Bastion took the belt and held it irresolutely in his hand. Would you like to try it now? she asked just to see how it works. To Bastion's surprise, the belt was a perfect fit, but it gave him a most unpleasant feeling not to see his own body. He wanted to take the belt off, but that wasn't so easy since he could see neither the buckle nor his own hands. Help! he cried in a panic, suddenly afraid that he would never find the buckle and remain invisible forever. You have to learn to handle it, said Zaida. I had the same trouble at first. Permit me to help you, my lord and master. She reached into the empty air. A moment later, she had unfastened the belt and Bastion was relieved to see himself again. He laughed while Zaida drew smoke from her water pipe and smiled. If nothing else, she had cheered him up. Now you are safe from harm, she said gently, and that means more to me than you can imagine. Harm? asked Bastion, still slightly befuddled. What sort of harm? Oh, no one can contend with you, Zaida whispered. Not if you are wise. The danger is inside you, and that's why it's hard to protect you against it. Inside me? What does that mean? A wise person stands above things he neither loves nor hates. But you, my lord, set store by friendship. Your heart should be as cold and indifferent as a snow-covered mountain peak, and it isn't. That's why someone can harm you. Someone? What someone? Someone you still care for in spite of all his insolence. Speak more plainly. That rude, arrogant little savage from the green-skinned country, my lord. Atreyu? Yes, and that outrageous, impertinent Falcor. You think they'd want to harm me? Bastion could hardly keep from laughing. Zaida bowed her head and said nothing. I'll never believe that, said Bastion. I won't listen to another word. Zaida still said nothing. She bowed her head still lower. After a long silence, Bastion asked, What do you suppose Atreyu is plotting? My lord, Zaida whispered, I wish I hadn't spoken. Well, now that you've started, Bastion cried, tell me everything. Stop beating about the bush. What do you know? I tremble at your anger, my lord, Zaida stammered, and true enough, she was all a tremble. But even if it costs me my life, I will tell you. Atreyu is plotting to take the childlike empress amulet away from you by stealth or by force. 
For a moment, Bastian could hardly breathe. Can you prove it? he asked. Zaida shook her head. My knowledge, she murmured, is not of the kind that can be proved. Then keep it to yourself, said Bastian, the blood rising to his face, and don't malign the truest, bravest boy in all Fantasia. With that, he jumped out of the litter and left her. Zaida's fingers played with the snake's head, and her green and red eyes glowed. After a while, she smiled again. Violet smoke rose from her mouth, and she whispered, You will see, my lord and master. The belt Gamal will show you. When the camp was set up that night, Bastion went to his tent. He ordered Ilwan, the blue djinn, not to admit anyone, and especially not Zaida. He wanted to be alone and to think. When the sorceress had told him about Atreyu, had told him about Atreyu hardly seemed worth troubling his head about. He had something else on his mind, those few words she had dropped about wisdom. He had been through so much. He had known joy and fear, discouragement and triumph. He had rushed from wish fulfillment to wish fulfillment, never stopping to rest, and nothing had brought him calm and contentment. To be wise was to be above joy and sorrow, fear and pity, ambition and humiliation. It was to hate nothing and to love nothing, and above all, to be utterly indifferent to the love and hate of others. A truly wise man attached no importance to anything. Nothing could upset him, and nothing could harm him. Yes, to be like that would be his final wish, the wish that would bring him to what he really wanted. Now he thought he understood what Grogrimmon had meant by those words, and so he wished to become wise, the wisest being in all Fantasia. A little later, he stepped out of his tent. The moon cast its light on a landscape that he had scarcely noticed up until then. The tent city lay in a hollow ringed about by strangely shaped mountains. The silence was complete. The hollow was fairly well wooded, while on the mountain slopes the vegetation became more sparse, and further up there was none at all. The peaks formed all manner of figures, almost as though a giant sculptor had shaped them. No breeze was blowing, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. The stars glittered and seemed nearer than usual. At the top of one of the highest peaks, Bastion made out a sort of cupola. It seemed to be inhabited, for it gave off a faint light. I've noticed it too, my lord, said Ilwan in his rapping voice, rasping voice. He was standing at his post by the entrance to the tent. What can it be? He had no sooner spoken than Bastion heard a strange cry in the distance. It suggested the long, drawn-out hooting of an owl, but it was deeper and louder. It sounded a second and then a third time, but now there were several voices. Owls they were indeed, six in number, as Bastion was soon to find out. Coming from the direction of the cupola, they glided at an incredible speed on almost motionless wings. Soon they were close enough for Bastion to see how amazingly large they were. Their eyes glittered, and their erect ears were capped with bundles of down. Their flight was soundless, but as they landed, a faint whirring of their wings could be heard. Then they were sitting on the ground in front of Bastion's tent, swiveling their heads with their great round eyes in all directions. Bastion went up to them. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'And who are you looking for?' We were sent by Rushtu, the mother of intuition, said one of the six owls. We are messengers from Gigum, the star cloister. What sort of cloister is that? Bastion asked. It is the home of wisdom, said another of the owls, where the monks of knowledge live. And who is Ushtu? Bastion asked. One of the three deep thinkers who direct the cloister and instruct the monks said a third owl. We are the night messengers which put us in her department. If it were daytime, said a fourth owl, Shirkri, the father of vision, would have sent his messengers, who are eagles, and in the twilight hours between day and night, Yasipu, the son of reason, sends his messengers, who are foxes. Who are Shirkri and, Yis and Yasipu? They are the other deep thinkers. 
our superiors. And what are you doing here? We are looking for the great knower, said the sixth owl. The three deep thinkers know he is in this tenth city and have sent us to beg him for illumination. The great knower, asked Bastion, who is that? His name, replied all six owls at once, is Bastion Balthasar Bucks. You found him, said Bastion. It's me. They bowed low, which because of their jerky movements looked almost comical in spite of their great size. The three deep thinkers, said the first owl, beg you humbly and respectfully to visit them. They hope you will solve a problem they have been trying in vain to solve all their long lives. Bastion stroked his chin thoughtfully. Very well, he answered after a while, but I must take my two disciples with me. There are six of us, said the owl. Two of us will carry each one of you. Bastion turned to the blue djinn. Ilwan, he said, bring me Atreyu and Zaida. The djinn bowed and went his way. What is this problem they want me to solve? Bastion asked. Oh, great knower, said one of the owls. We are only poor, ignorant messengers. We don't even belong to the lowest rank of the monks of knowledge. How could we possibly have cognizance of the problem with the deep thinkers in all their long lives have been unable to solve? A few minutes later, Ilwan came back with Atreyu and Zaida. On the way, he had told them what it was all about. As he stood before Bastion, Atreyu asked in an undertone, Why me? Indeed, said Zaida. Why him? You will find out, said Bastion. With admirable foresight, the owls had brought trapezes, one for every two owls. Bastion, Atreyu, and Zaida sat on the bars, and the great night birds, each holding a trapeze rope in its claws, rose into the air. When the travelers reached the star cloister of Gigum, they found that the great cupola was only the uppermost part of a large building comp composed of many cubicle compartments. It had innumerable little windows, and its outer wall might have been taken for the continuation of a sheer cliff. An unbidden visitor could hardly have gained admittance to the place. The cubicle compartments contained the cells of the monks of knowledge, the libraries, the refectories, and the lodgings of the messengers. The meeting hall, where the three deep thinkers delivered their lectures, was situated under the cupola. The monks of knowledge were fantasians of all kinds from every part of the realm, but anyone wishing to enter the cloister had to break off all contact with family and country. The lives of these monks were hard and frugal, devoted exclusively to knowledge. The community was far from accepting all applicants. The examinations were difficult and the three deep thinkers set the highest standards. Thus there were seldom more than 300 monks in the cloister at one time. But these were by far the most intelligent persons in all Fantasia. Occasionally the community dwindled to seven members, but even then there was no thought of relaxing the entrance requirements. At the moment the monks and monkesses numbered roughly 200. When Bastion, followed by Atreyu and Zaida, was led into the large lecture hall, he saw a motley assortment of Fantasians who differed from his own retinue only in that they all were dressed in rough, dark brown monk's robes. A wandering cliff or a tiny must have looked very strange in such an outfit. The superiors of the order, the three deep thinkers, were built like humans except for their heads. Ushtu, the mother of intuition, had the head of an owl. Shurkri, the father of vision, the head of an eagle, and Yasipu, the son of reason, the head of a fox. They sat in raised stone chairs and looked enormous. The sight of them seemed to intimidate Atreyu and even Zaida, but Bastion stepped right up to them. With a motion of his head, Shurkri, who was evidently the oldest of the three and was sitting in the middle, indicated an empty chair facing the deep thinkers. Bastion sat down in it. After a prolonged silence, Shirkri spoke. He spoke softly, but his voice sounded surprisingly deep and full. 
Since time immemorial, since time immemorial, we have been pondering the enigma of our world. Yasipu's reasonings in the matter are different from Ushtu's intuitions, and Ushtu's intuitions differ from my vision, which in turn is different from Yasipu's reasonings. This is intolerable and must not be allowed to go on. That is why we have asked the great knower to come here and instruct us. Are you willing? I am, said Bastian. Then, O oh great knower, hear our question. What is Fantasia? After a short silence, Bastian replied, Fantasia is the never-ending story. Give us time to understand your answer, said Shirkri. Let us meet again here tomorrow at the same hour. Silently, the three deep thinkers and the monks of knowledge arose and all left the hall. Bastian, Atreyu, and Zaida were led to guest cells where a simple meal awaited them. Their beds were wooden planks covered with rough woolen blankets. Though this didn't matter to Bastian and Atreyu, Zaida would have liked to conjure up a more comfortable bed, but she soon found to her dismay that her magic powers were without effect in this cloister. Late the following night, the monks and the three deep thinkers met again in the great meeting hall. Once again, Bastian occupied the high seat. Zaida and Atreyu sat to the left and right of him. This time, it was Ushtu, the mother of intuition, who scrutinized Bastian with her great owl's eyes and said, We have meditated on your answer, O great knower, but a new question has occurred to us. If, as you say, Fantasia is the never-ending story, where is this never-ending story to be found? After a short silence, Bastian replied, In a book bound with copper-colored silk, Give us time to understand your words, said Ushtu. Let us meet again tomorrow at the same hour. When they had gathered in the meeting hall the following night, Yasipu, the son of reason, took the floor. Again, we have meditated on your answer, O great knower, he said. And again, a new question comes to perplex us. If our world, Fantasia, is a never-ending story, and if this never-ending story is in a book bound in copper-colored silk, where then is this book? And after a short silence, Bastian replied, In the attic of a schoolhouse. O oh, great knower, said the fox-headed Yasipu, we do not doubt the truth of what you say. But now we would like to ask you to let us see this truth. Can you do that? Bastian thought it over, then he said, I believe I can. Atreyu looked at Bastian with surprise. Zaida, too, had a questioning look in her red and green eyes. Let us meet again tomorrow night at the same hour, said Bastian, but not here. Let us meet on the roof of the star cloister, and then you must keep your eyes fixed on the heavens. The following night was as clear as the three before it. At the appointed hour, the three deep thinkers and all the monks of knowledge were gathered on the roof of the star cloister. Atreyu and Zaida, who had no idea what Bastion was up to, were there too. Bastion climbed to the top of the great cupola and looked around. For the first time, he saw the ivory tower far off on the horizon shimmering in the moonlight. He took the stone, El Tzahir, from his pocket. It sent out a soft glow. He then called to mind the inscription he had seen on the door of the Amarganth Library. But if he says my name a second time, from the end to the beginning, I will glow in one moment with the light of a hundred years. He held the stone up high and cried out, Rehast la! At that moment, there came a flash of lightning so bright that illumined, and that space was the schoolhouse attic with its age-blackened beams. In a moment, the vision passed, and the light of a hundred years was gone. El Tzahir had vanished without a trace. It was some time before the eyes of those present, including bastions, became accustomed to the feeble light of the moon and the stars. Shaken by what they had seen, all gathered in the great lecture hall. Bastion was the last to enter. The monks of knowledge and the three deep thinkers arose from their seats and bowed low to him. 
I have no words, said Shirkri, with which to thank you for that flash of illumination, O great knower. For in that mysterious attic I glimpsed a being of my own kind, an eagle. You are mistaken, Shirkri, said the owl-faced Ushtu with a gentle smile. I saw the creature plainly. It was an owl. You are both mistaken, cried Yasipu, his eyes aflame. That being is a relative of mine, a fox. Shirkri raised his hands in horror. Here we are, back where we started, he said. You alone, O great knower, can answer this new question. Which of us is right? Smiling serenely, Bastion replied, All three. Give us time to understand your answer, said Ushtu. All the time you wish, Bastion replied, for we shall be leaving you now. Bitter disappointment could be read on the faces of the three deep thinkers and of the monks of knowledge. They implored Bastion to stay longer, or better still, forever, but with a rather disrespectful shrug, he declined. Whereupon the six messengers carried him and his two disciples back to the tenth city. That night, the usual harmony of the three deep thinkers was disturbed by a first radical difference of opinion, which years later led to the breakup of the community. Then Ushtu, the mother of intuition, Shirkri, the father of vision, and Yasipu, the son of reason, each founded a cloister of his own. But that is another story, and shall be told another time. That night, Bastion lost all memory of having gone to school. The attic and the stolen book bound in copper-colored silk vanished from his mind, and he even stopped asking himself how he had come to Fantasia.